What a great morning. Um, just fantastic lectures this morning. And again, want to thank Lou and all the speakers for what had to be really the best think tank morning ever. Uh, and, and, and thank the audience for the engagement and the great questions and discussion. Uh, I think this afternoon will be as good. I think it has the potential to be as informative, uh, both in terms of teaching, uh, didactics, as well as you know, provocative issues that will arise. And we, the first session, we have, a, we have a great session, Felipe Medeiros, just, just off a plane. We didn't know what was happening with him. He was, uh, he was coming in from Miami, and he went through several delays and planes and changes in planes. And he, I think he just got in from the airport. So Felipe, great that you're here. Uh, Derek Wellsby's joining us, and, and I'll be uh, speaking as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Derek Wellsby. Derek is associate professor of ophthalmology, and, uh, and he's just a brilliant clinician scientist uh, who is very interested in uh, restoring vision to patients with glaucoma, rescuing the optic nerve, and all the things that we want to do uh, in glaucoma. Derek? Let's see here. So best TGF morning ever. It's a hard act to follow. <laughs> Uh, but thank you guys for inviting me here to speak about an overview on glaucoma neuroprotective agents. And I got to tell you already in advance, I feel a little guilty because half of what I'm going to talk about is Simon John's work. So I hope I do it justice. <laughs> okay, so first relevant disclosures. You know, we started lowering eye pressure for glaucoma back in the 1860s and 160 years later. That's still the mainstay of treatment. And so what we really need is a neuroprotective therapy that directly interferes with that neurodegenerative signal and that could be used to complement pressure lowering. But to do that, we have to have an understanding of axon injury signaling. Now, this is the drawing of a typical ganglion cell, shorter dendrites, longer axon, but that's not drawn to scale. If it was drawn to scale, it would look like this. Really, a ganglion cell is just a gigantic axon. It's 95% by volume axon. That axon requires a huge energetic demand. And Simon John's lab has shown that the axon is the initial site of injury in all these experimental models of glaucoma. So let's try to understand axon injury signaling because that affords us an opportunity to develop robust neuroprotectives. So here's an easier to digest uh, picture. So when you have an injury to the axon, really there's four things that happen. The first is that there's normally these pro-survival anterograde signals that are being propagated down the axon that stop at the site of injury. There's also retrograde, and that leads to an axon degeneration. There's also these retrograde signals that are pro-survival also that stop at the site of injury. We also generate new deleterious pro-degenerative uh, signals that propagate anterograde, causing axon degeneration. And then fourthly, in the, in the pattern, you have new pro-degenerative signals that propagate retrograde that trigger cell death. And so that really gives us four different possibilities for neuroprotection, right? You can take those pro-survival guys and replace them, or you can take the pro-degenerative signals and you can block them. And although I make it sound as if there's really just these four categories, there's a lot of interplay so that one therapy can actually you know, uh, interface with multiple uh, pathways. So let's first start with the anterograde signals of injury that lead primarily to axon degeneration. And for that, I'm gonna tell you four very quick stories. And they all approach axon degeneration from a different angle. But interestingly, they're all gonna converge on the same final Kahneman pathway. So the first mini story starts with a genetic mouse mutation that was discovered in the late 80s. And when you transect the axon of a nerve cell, distal to that, the axon degenerates in a process called Wallerian degeneration. There's a strain of mouse, this Ola strain of mouse, that had slowed Wallerian degeneration. In fact, they changed the name. 
They called it the wild S mouse for slowed Wallerian degeneration. And that's interesting, but what is wild S? So it turns out that mice have a gene called NMNAT1, followed by another gene called UBE4B. They're distinct, they have nothing to do with each other. In the wild S mutation, UBE4B is reversed, there's a fusion protein, and the locus is triplicated. And you'll see why this is important in just a second. The key here is that wild S doesn't just protect against Wallerian degeneration from transection. Simon John's lab asked whether it would protect against glaucoma. And so they used the DBA2 or D2 mouse model. This is a pigmentary glaucoma where you see the damage mostly between like nine and 12 months. And this is, you know, pictures of the retina and optic nerve from one of those 12 month old D2 animals. And you see, you know, both the retina and the optic nerve have lost a lot of the ganglion cells. But in D2 mice with the wild S mutation, there is robust protection. Uh, Pete Williams from his lab then asked the question, well, could we just overexpress the NMNAT piece of wild S and get that protection in the D2 mouse? So now you're looking at the connectivity to the brain in vector treated animals, but in animals treated with AAV to overexpress NMNAT1, you see a preservation of those central connections to the brain. Okay, well, there's two implications of that. First is that that means that the active part of wild S is really the NMNAT half of it. And then the second thing is, this validates NMNAT1 as a potential gene therapy and neuroprotective for glaucoma. Also, they looked at function and showed by pattern ERG, there was a rescue of function. The second mini story involves a close cousin, NMNAT2. There's a ribotag mouse that one can use to pull down ribosomes to, uh, selectively from RGCs and that way you can only look at actively translated tra uh, transcripts in RGCs. Young Hu took this technology and applied it to a mouse model of glaucoma that he created with intracameral injection of silicon oil to cause a pupillary block and secondary glaucoma. And he asked the question, what are the genes that change before and after inducing experimental glaucoma? And interestingly, one of the most down-regulated genes was NMNAT two, which is a paralog of NMNAT1 that I just told you about. He then asked the question, well, what would happen if you put back NMNAT2? So here's the model showing, you know, it does what you expect, which is it causes loss of RGCs. But in mice treated with an AAV to overexpress a mutant form of NMNAT2, there was rescue of that ganglion cell loss. The third mini story comes from Mark Freeman's lab. So he was doing screens in Drosophila to look for genes involved in Wallerian degeneration. So there's some olfactory neuron, they crush this in larval uh, flies, and some poor student is screening through thousands of mutant flies looking for the one that might have delayed or inhibited Wallerian degeneration. This is what it would typically look like. This is the loss of axons you see on the right. And this was a fly that had a mutation in a gene called DSARM that had very robust protection of axons. And what was particularly interesting is that DSARM has a mouth ortholog called SARM1. So Young Hu's lab then asked, well, what about that silicon oil model? What happens if we get rid of SARM1? Do we get protection? So this is the loss of RGCs you see in his silicon oil model. And this is that same model performed in the SARM1 knockouts showing robust ganglion cell protection. And then the, oh, by the way, this is work from our lab. This is Natalie Chow in my lab. She wanted to ask whether SARM1 could be pharmacologically inhibited uh, because that's a potential therapy in human RGC. So these are the stem cell derived retinal ganglion cells that were developed by Val Slush and Don Zach's lab. We can pharmacologically injure their axons and we get cell death and degeneration. And if we inhibit SARM1, we get very nice protection. The fourth mini story is about vitamin B3, and that's the nicotinamide, not niacin, and NAD. So again, Simon John was looking at gene expression changes in those D2 mice as they age and develop more and more severe glaucoma. And they noticed that the uh, nuclear encoded mitochondrial genes had differential expression. They were changing 
with disease progression. They also noted that the metabolic cofactor, NAD+, was decreasing in the retina with disease progression and with age. And more importantly, if you fed the mice vitamin B3 or nicotinamid, you could restore those levels of NAD. So then, of course, the question is, what would happen to the RGC degeneration? So what you're looking at is that uh, a normal D2 mouse that has a, uh, a change so that it doesn't develop glaucoma, and you're looking at the retina, optic nerve, optic nerve head, and two brain centers. The second row is the 12-month-old D2 mice where you see loss of RGCs in each of those structures. And in mice where you started supplementing them with oral nicotinamide at six months of age, there is very robust protection. And when you looked at those deleterious gene expression changes, those also reversed. So, you know, those are four quick stories that, taught, that you know, highlight four potential therapies that all protected ganglion cells. And I'm not one, and I'm not two, SARM-1 inhibition, and nicotinamid. And while seemingly distinct, they're actually four parts of one story. So it turns out that NMNATs are the enzymes that take nicotinamid mononucleotide, hook it to another mononucleotide called ATP, and form something called nicotinamid adenine dinucleotide. So it consumes NMN and makes NAD. And NAD is involved in all sorts of processes, including aging. And so NMN is axon destructive, while NAD is axon protective. And it starts to make sense why NMNATs could be neuroprotective because they're consuming NMN and producing NMA, uh, NAD. Turns out there's actually three of these NMNAT enzymes, one, two, and three. And they each have a loop that determines their subcellular localization. So on this schematic of a cell, NMNAT1 localizes to the nucleus, NMNAT3 to the mitochondria, and 2 to the Golgi. But that localization to the Golgi causes NMNAT2 to degrade. So actually, it has the by far the shortest half-life of the three NMNATs. That being said, it's the one that's on vesicles and on the cytoplasmic surface, so it's the one that gets transported to the axon, and it's the one that controls axonal NAD levels. So Michael Coleman's lab has developed the following model of axon degeneration. Essentially, what happens is the cell is constantly transporting this unstable NMNAT2 down the axon, and it's causing NAD levels to stay high. And it's okay that it's unstable because you're constantly making new NAD, uh, NMNATs and you know, sending it down the axon. But in the setting of axon injury, that flow of NMNAT2 is disrupted, and all the existing NMNAT2 turns over very quickly, so that NAD levels fall, and you get axon uh, degeneration. And so the gene therapy approaches, which I think are very promising to perhaps rescue this, would be we have to somehow get a stable NMNAT to the axon. One way to do that is to replace that nuclear localization signal on NMNAT1, right? NMNAT1 is a stable NMNAT. You just have to replace this nuclear localization signal, and that's actually what WildS does. That's what that UBE4B piece did. Another way is you can just delete the nuclear localization signal. Another option is you could take NMNAT2 and you can delete its Golgi targeting signal. And now if it's not on a Golgi, now it's stable. And both NMNAT1 and 2, if they're in the cytoplasm, can diffuse down the axon and rescue NAD levels. And that's why I was very careful to mention that when Simon's lab and Young Hu's lab were putting in AAV constructs to overexpress these NMNATs, they're using these mutant NMNATs, which are cytoplasmic and stable. So what about SARM-1? Well, SARM-1 is the enzyme that degrades NAD. It clips off this nicotinamide moiety and leaves you with something called ADPR. And so here's the current thinking of how axon degeneration happens in neurons. Again, typically, axons are filled with this NMNAT. In the setting of an injury, NMNAT levels fall. And if that's the enzyme that takes NMN and converts it to NAD, when the level falls, your NMN builds up and your NAD falls. But then in addition, NMN turns out to be the allosteric activator of SARM-1. So now when SARM-1 gets activated, that degrades NAD even further. So compounding the problem, right? You just stopped making NAD, and now you're going to start to consume NAD. 
And this positive feedback loop continues until you've lost all of the axonal NAD and you get this energetic collapse of the axon. And you can imagine that a neuroprotective therapy could take the place or could take the form of nicotinamide or NAD supplementation, SARM-1 inhibition, or augmentation with these relocalized forms of NMAT. And there are two short-term clinical trials that have been performed on oral nicotinamide using doses somewhere between one and three grams over a time course of something like six to 12 weeks. Uh, one is Jeff Liebman's group, another is Johnny Krauston, using outcomes like uh, ERGs or points on a visual field. And both have shown neural enhancement where actually people did better with the supplementation. So far, there have not been uh, effects on global visual field indices or on OCT endpoints, but it's, you know, as uh, Anthony pointed out earlier, there's something like four trials right now of nicotinamide that over a long term, we might be able to see these, you know, these neuroprotective features. Now let's talk about the retrograde signals that typically cause cell death. So what I'm showing here is an animation of neurotrophin signaling. So you can imagine there's a ganglion cell axon intervening or innervating some you know, lateral geniculate nucleus neuron. That LGN neuron makes, has vesicles with neurotrophins like BDNF. They fuse with the membrane, dump their contents into the synaptic cleft, and that binds to receptors on the presynaptic neuron, like the RGC. That leads to endocytosis of what's called a signaling endosome. And that signaling endosome travels back up the axon, retrograde to the cell body, and basically tells the cell body, hey, there's been a successful handshake here. This is a useful connection. Let's preserve the connection. Let's preserve the neuron. Don Zach and Harry Quigley showed that in rodent models of experimental glaucoma, that transport of the signaling endosome back up the axon is interrupted. So what you're looking here is that track B signal, um, Oh, we didn't catch this one. We caught several. The Mac to PC transition uh, killed some of the photos. This one, uh, the bottom one is showing, you just imagine uniform track B uh, up and down the axon. And when you uh, do experimental glaucoma, that you get a buildup of that signaling endosome right at the glial lamina of the rodent. So Keith Martin asked whether we could overcome that blockade by simply using AAV transduce the ganglion cell and have it overexpress track B plus BDNF. So again, they turned to the rodent, uh, this is the rat laser model of glaucoma. They showed that the BDNF had no effect on the IOP, so there's the same injury, but there was a dose dependent increase in RGC survival. Keith's uh, company, he had a startup called Qthera that was then acquired by Astellas and we're still yet to see uh, where they go with this. Don's lab and then also my lab have been interested in using another technique called functional genomic screening. And the idea here is to simply screen through every gene in a ganglion cell one by one and ask, is that gene causally important in keeping a ganglion cell alive? And so we use these immunopanned primary mouse RGCs. The process of immunopanning damages their axon. We then seed these ganglion cells into these multi-well dishes as shown here. We then transfect them with siRNAs to knock down gene expression, doing one gene at a time and going through a library of siRNAs. And because we've injured the axon of these ganglion cells, if we do nothing, 72 hours later, most of them have died. And of course, what we do then is we come in with automated image uh, and, uh, imaging and analysis to count the number of surviving ganglion cells in each of those wells. And what we care about is what is that well right there that knocked out of a gene seemed to improve survival, suggesting that that could be a good drug target. So what you're looking at here is a histogram of our first screen of about 600 kinases with the most survival promoting kinases on the right. And the top hit was a gene called DLK. We could then repeat the screen, starting with DLK knocked down, and ask for what genes synergize with DLK. And we got DLK's closest cousin, the ortholog LZK. Oh, sorry, the paralog LZK. We could then, we got kind of good at screening. So instead of doing these 600 gene libraries, we did the whole mouse genome twice. 
And so having gone through 17,000 genes, we were able to dissect some of the downstream mediators of DLK signaling. This is the current model for what's going on. Typically, DLK is kept at very low levels in an axon. When there's injury, DLK gets locally upregulated, and it is the retrograde signal that tells the cell there's been an injury at that axon. DLK causes a phosphorylation cascade, culminating in transcription factors being phosphorylated, and that sets in motion that cell death program. So DLK is a pretty attractive target for glaucoma neuroprotection for several reasons. First is that it was identified in an unbiased way, right? We simply went through all genes, and even after going through all 17,000, DLK, LZK is still the number one hit, the number one thing you can do to a ganglion cell to keep it alive. Second thing is it's been validated now by multiple independent labs. Third, and these are some of the slides I had to take out because of the, the, the Mac to PC change, there is a, a durable effect. So when you get rid of DLK in the mouse, you don't just delay cell death, you prevent it. You can look 18 weeks later, which is like a fourth of the lifespan of these mice, and there's still the same level of protection if you looked at two weeks. Next thing is we see axonal protection because DLK turns out to also have effects on NMNATs and SARM. And the other thing that's quite nice is that DLK, being that retrograde injury signal, is very upstream in the process, right? You can imagine there's a lot of neuroprotective approaches out there where you just try to interfere with cell death before the cell takes that last step towards cell death, but that's not what you're trying to keep alive. What you're trying to keep alive is essentially a normal neuron. And so being very upstream in the injury cascade is advantageous. So, you know, Don's lab, my lab have worked with pharma to develop a small molecule inhibitor of DLK and LZK. Shown here is a flat mount of retina replete with ganglion cells. This is four weeks after optic nerve crush, where you're seeing the typical 90 to 95% loss of RGCs. And this is a single injection of the DLK LZK inhibitor given at the time of injury, giving what I think is essentially unprecedented protection to ganglion cells. So, you know, in conclusion, I've talked to you about four injury signals, two that are lost with injury and two that are gained with injury, each one half anterograde, the other half retrograde. And each of these four are really targets for what I think are going to be some of the most robust RGC intrinsic neuroprotective therapies. Now, of course, keep in mind, I didn't talk about any of this stuff outside of the RGC because it was so nicely covered in the morning session, but neuroinflammation, glia, vasculature, laminar remodeling, these are all other potential neuroprotective targets. Of course, I'd like to thank the people in Don's lab I've worked with, my own lab, and funding sources. Thank you very much. I think the best summary that I've ever heard of a subject, Eric, and, and I think it'll really stimulate a lot of questions uh, and a lot of thoughts. Um, can't talk about neuroprotection without talking about why we do not yet have a glaucoma neuroprotection. And uh, I thought talking about some of the lessons we've learned, reflecting upon what we've learned from neuroprotection trials and where we're going might be a useful starting point. Um, number of disclosures, I'm not gonna be talking about anything that's directly relevant to any of these things. So here's a concept uh, with Len Levine, we introduced and brought to the ophthalmic community uh, 25 years ago. Um, at the time we were thinking there's a lot of different things that can damage the optic nerve in glaucoma and we were treating one of them. And, and we had the potential to treat others. We're still talking about things like ischemia and genetic factors and failure of trophic support, as Derek was talking about. Of course, our discussions are a lot more sophisticated now. Uh, but we brought to the ophthalmic community the idea of protecting the optic nerve and retinal ganglion cells independent of whatever it is that was damaging them. And I couldn't believe that we'd be talking 25 years later about, you know, how do we do that? Uh, 
We put together this little cartoon that we published in The Lancet in 2004 uh, with Ping Kaw that summarized some of the factors at the time that we thought might be contributing. At the top, we had mitochondria, even though we had very little information at the time, we, we knew it was gonna be important. Uh, on the very bottom, we had excessive glutamate stimulation, and I'll talk a little more about that later, but we had other things like aberrant immunity and blockade of the neurotrophin and other target-derived factors that Derek just summarized. And of course, there's microcirculation, the subject that still, still needs to be investigated. You can't talk about neuroprotection without coming up with a working definition, so I'll just propose this for the subject today. Uh, you might have your own definition. Uh, therapy, independent of IOP lowering, that enhances the survival and function of retinal ganglion cells and other neurons within the central visual pathway. Now, many of you are going to say, well, isn't lowering intraocular pressure neuroprotective? I'm not going to argue with you. Uh, because it can and often does protect the optic nerve. Does it always protect the optic nerve? I'm not sure about that. There are some colleagues who think if you lower it enough, it'll always protect the optic nerve. If you lower the quality of IOP sufficiently, it'll always protect the optic nerve. And there are some nihilists, I'm probably in the group, that think that you know IOP alone is not sufficient. It was very interesting this morning to, I think Anthony said, Two thirds of, of uh, the genes that they've looked at are IOP related, and about a third of them are non IOP related. Or Stewart said that. And again, if you're going to talk about neuroprotection, you've got to wonder who is this going to be useful for? And again, I'll propose two groups. Again, each of you might have your own groups. Uh, Neuroprotective agent or agents might be complementary to IOP lowering for those in whom lowering of intraocular pressure does not adequately ameliorate the progressive loss of visual function. In other words, we're not going to abandon IOP lowering therapy, or it might be an alternative therapy for those in whom pressure lowering agents are not used, not tolerated, or ineffective. I wanted to get some understanding of why we don't have a neuroprotective agent. It, you know, it's been over 25 years. Why don't we have one already? I wanted to reach out to some of the smartest people I knew. So I tried contacting Dr. Medeiros, but he was in transit. He bought a house in Miami and, and he had to unpack. And then I called Derek Wellesley and he was traveling somewhere with his family. So I thought I, I might use something like you know, natural language processing has been of a lot of interest. I called Sally Baxter, who I fit in that category, is one of the smartest people I know, and, and she had a great suggestion for me. Actually, Sally would have suggested this, but she was in Japan and our, we were off on timing. So I did the next best thing. I got a hell to somebody who I thought everybody would say is one of the smartest people they know. As of 2023, no neuroprotective agents for glaucoma have been approved due to several challenges. Glaucoma is a complex disease that involves multiple damaging pathways, making it difficult to develop a single, effective agent. Delivering drugs to the retina and optic nerve in therapeutic concentrations is a substantial challenge. The absence of animal models that closely mirror human glaucoma complicates the translation of successful animal studies into effective human treatments. Moreover, conducting long-term, costly clinical trials to demonstrate the effectiveness of a neuroprotective agent is difficult due to the slow progression of the disease. Research continues, and there is hope for future neuroprotective treatments for glaucoma. Currently, the main treatment strategy is reducing intraocular pressure. Well, thank you. It's, it's frightening, but my gosh, it's right on. So I'm going to summarize what he taught me. There, there are challenges. Well, here's an updated cartoon that was published in just last year. Here are some common mechanisms of neurodegeneration. Uh, we had a great discussion this morning about, you know, question about environmental factors. We talked about 
metabolic stress, and Derek summarized some of that very nicely, and, and Anthony and Stuart talked about genetic contributors, and we heard about neurovascular coupling and, and neuroinflammation, which we know very, very little about. What about identifying a neuroprotective agent? You know, again, this is something that most attention has been directed at identifying a neuroprotective agent. Uh, every laboratory, uh, all of our industry partners and, and colleagues, everybody has something that they're interested in. Either they, they, own, they own a product or they discovered something that they'd like to be introduced into neuroprotective trials. And we have some mechanisms for studying these, whether they be in vitro, uh, whether they're ex vivo or in vivo. In each of these, we've learned something from, we heard about mouse models, uh, we've heard about uh, some functional high throughput screening from Derek, and we haven't talked about much, but, but of course we have non-primate human, uh, non-human primate models that are costly, very difficult to work with. Each of these, again, we learn, but they don't provide the answers that we need. I you know, wonder, with an appropriate drug, does a trial of a neuroprotection agent now have a high likelihood for achieving clinical endpoints within a reasonable time period and on the reasonable time cost? And I think it, it, it does. I think there are probably a number of possible drugs. Derek identified that there's just not one, but there are many. And I th think uh, that we have ways of dealing with this. This is something that uh, I modified from info that Jeff Liebman gave me. Uh, here are some of the challenges facing glaucoma neuroprotection trials. Uh, we could spend a week or more discussing these, and I guess we have spent years discussing them. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about some of the things in red, talking about study duration, endpoint selection, study size, selection of target patients, and risk profiles. And Felipe Medeiros is going to follow me, and he'll get into some of this as well. So one question that often arises is who should be recruited to the trial? And again, we've had these discussions for 25 years, and, and we continue to change the target patients for who should be recruited to the trial. But, but the, general, the general summary of my take on this is more tightly defined patients often lead to smaller sample sizes with less power to detect moderate treatment effects. So, you know, we can take patients who are rapidly progressing under standard therapy or have various risk factors for prog progression, like a disc hemorrhage or exfoliation. Um, they're, a little, they're more difficult to enroll in a trial looking for these patients. It reduces the generalizability of the trial as well. And we don't know how regulatory bodies are going to deal with this if you're doing a trial and you're including patients with disc hemorrhage. Are they going to allow you to generalize it to patients without disc hemorrhage? The studied primary endpoint is critical to demonstrate that a therapeutic intervention is effective. And we have many, many types of endpoints. Uh, some desirable ones are not practical or they're not readily detectable. And measurable responses often depend on the stage of the disease, something that, that probably should pay, we should pay more attention to. The ultimate goal of our management is to preserve visual function and vision-related quality of life. And so we have possible clinical endpoints. Visual field is the obvious one. Uh, this is the regulatory gold standard. You know, you go to the FDA and, and they, they, they're going to try to fit you into a template. Uh, we have disadvantages. It's, it is insensitive early in the disease. Uh, it's variable, particularly late in the disease. We have ways of maybe mitigating some of these problems. We could increase the frequency of testing. Uh, we can cluster at baseline and at the end of the trial. But it, it's still limited. We also have clinical endpoints that are structural, uh, including the optic disc, 
the retinal nerve fiber layer. And importantly, and something often omitted, uh, particularly since there's a lot of new information that hasn't yet been digested into our clinical practice, the role of the macula. So structural change may, may I, I emphasize, not always, appear before detectable change in functional measures. Um, we could do imaging through undilated pupils. Uh, we can increasingly rapidly acquire images and we can do lots of tests. So we might have trouble doing one or two or three visual fields, even at baseline. You can't just do them over and over again. Patients get fatigued. But we could do several imaging tests. And by including a structural endpoint, we could reduce the sample size. Bottom line, if we could include structural measures, um, we'd have a shorter trial. And to many of the people in the room, that means a less costly trial, a less expensive trial. Well, with a lot of that in mind, more than 10 years ago, we went to the FDA, and this was a group that was organized by Arvo, working with uh, Wally Chambers, who at the time, and still to this day, oversees the FDA and the control of, of drug approvals. And we asked questions like, what is the precise nature of the relationship between structural change and functional change? And we ask, can structural change be used as a surrogate for functional change? Does structural change predict functional change? And if so, can we quantify this? And we got a little flexibility. Um, it, it was probably disappointing, but we, we made perhaps a little progress. Uh, we talked about functional outcomes, including standard automated perimetry, or SAP. Uh, we talked about the possibility of contrast sensitivity, color vision, visual acuity. In retina, these things have been employed. Uh, and then we talked about structural measurements. You know, they exist in the retinal community. Uh, they're measuring, you know, very typical, you know, uh, areas of atrophy, et cetera. And at the time, there were no structural measurements that were approved for glaucoma. And we were told you needed to have a very strong correlation to function, something that was uh, at the time, and maybe even today, is not really very practical or reasonable. And uh, Wiley Chambers uh, provided us with the following quote, the FDA is open to using structural endpoints in clinical trials of new glaucoma drugs, provided that the structural measurements pre predict, predict functional change uh, with something that's clinically meaningful. And he said some things that at the time we just didn't think were possible. Now, you can't talk about neuroprotection and why we don't have a neuroprotective drug without talking about the Memantine trial. And again, I want to acknowledge Jeff, who I brought in very early into the design of the trial. And, and let me also provide some background on the trial. We published the results in 2018. And uh, there was an immediate poll. It, it, it looked like New York City at 5 p.m. on Wednesday evening when when the, the official announcement came out um, and that the, the Memantine trial that was sponsored by Allegan that included more than 2,000 patients uh, failed to meet endpoint. That was, that was a statement, that was a public statement. Um, and we were embargoed really from publishing this for, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, forever. Uh, and then we finally were given permission to publish it. And that was the result of this publication. Um, it was, the study was designed, I began, stu I began designing this in the mid 1990s um, with Jeff and then subsequently, I think Jack Chaffee got involved. 
uh, we got approval to move ahead with the study. There were, had no study had ever been undertaken in glaucoma like this. Uh, there were two parallel arms with lots and lots of patients, very, very costly. We don't even know um, how costly, but it, it was hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, there were a couple flaws right at the beginning that we recognized and pushed back on. Uh, the FDA at the time did not include a data safety monitoring committee. And a senior vice president was, he was basically uh, doing the work of the data safety monitoring committee and, and some things probably uh, that a committee would have said no to uh, were moved ahead. The study included high risk patients. Uh, these were patients with disc hemorrhage, older age, uh, we did at the time, you know, every four months visual field testing, which at the time was a little more frequently than, than was being done in other studies to look for progression. And then we had the following criteria for progression. Uh, same five or more visual field locations demonstrating significant reduction from baseline in a confirmatory visual field obtained within eight weeks. And everyone knows Mamantine did not protect against visual field loss. And it's, it's, it's a story, Jeff and I probably should write a book on it someday about, you know, things that we could do better in a clinical trial, or everyone could do better in a clinical trial. We did learn some things. Um, the FDA did have some flexibility. Uh, we were doing some structural measurements. Uh, we also learned that a neuroprotection trial could be completed. At the time, we, we were at the very beginning of the trial, we thought we were going to have to close the trial down because all the photos that were being sent in from around the world, over 100 sites, they were calling glaucoma and, and our great optic disc reading center under the direction of Linda Zangwill saying, this is not glaucoma. And so we had to actually train trained glaucoma specialists had to recognize glaucoma. There were a few exceptions to that. Ivan Goldberg in particular was spot on with being able to recognize a glaucomatous disc. It, it sounds silly at the time. Uh, it was real. Um, and we finally developed sufficient worldwide expertise to enroll and follow patients. And, and again, we also were able to enroll patients at highest risk. It took a couple years to enroll them. And then another trial that's worth mentioning is the UK GTS trial. This was a 500 patient trial, and it was a two year study. Time to visual field progression was the endpoint. They clustered the visual field. David Crabb introduced that, and it, it was a great addition. Um, we didn't even think of that 20 years earlier. Uh, it was a modified EMGT, or early manifest glaucoma treatment study endpoint. And it showed that latanoprost treated eyes did better at preserving visual field than placebo. And we also learned some things from this trial. It was not really the most exciting result, but it was a necessary one for glaucoma. Uh, it, it validated clustering. Uh, instead of going several years in a trial, it showed you could do it a little shorter duration with a manageable number of patients, and that a visual field endpoint could be possible in a year, year and a half, and you might be able to get it through an IRB. It might not have gotten through an IRB in the United States, incidentally, uh, because it was a placebo, basically. It was an untreated group. Uh, we looked at, uh, with support from Genentech, we looked at uh, doing more frequent visual fields, and we were trying to make the, the trial a little more feasible. And we concluded that re with reduction of the rate of progression as the endpoint, we were looking again, at rate of progression rather than an event-based type of change, frequent testing and the moderate effect size, the results that clinical trials to test efficacy glaucoma therapy could be completed within 18 months and with fewer than 300 patients. And we thought this was a nice step forward. Again, faster trial, less costly. This is changing very quickly. This, this, is, this is just a fantastic paper by Felipe, just published. Uh, 
and, and he'll discuss this and some other things in the subsequent lecture. Uh, this was a study that basically looked at 246 eyes of 168 primary open angle glaucoma patients. These patients were followed at six months intervals. And it, it's an amazing result, basically. They looked at GPA progression. They also looked at the FDA endpoint, the FDA requirements. And the conclusion of the paper is that the slope of the MD change over the initial two years of follow-up is a suitable endpoint of progression in clinical trials. So great study, Felipe, and thanks for bringing that to our community. This is something that was published similarly, similar time interval. This is, this is from Gus and from Jeff Liebman. And, and this was different. This, this study, they, it looks like they went through Jeff's clinic population or the clinical population that he had access to. And in looking at, instead of looking at primary open angle glaucoma patients, they looked at, it looked like they looked at suspects and they looked at glaucoma patients. But interestingly, the conclusion is saying that the, the, the numbers are different, but the, the conclusion is the same that, you know, again, if there's rapid, rapid visual field, mean deviation changes over two years, uh, these eyes are much, much more likely to reach an FDA accepted endpoint during or after, during or soon after that period. The landscape is changing, and here we are 25 years later, and gosh, I, you know, again, I, would I be standing at a podium 25 years later and talking about, you know, why we don't have a neuroprotective agent? And, and I think this is going to change everything. Deep learning approaches that Felipe will get into, I'm sure, uh, predict glaucomatous visual field damage, and we can do so much now with deep learning. Uh, as an example, we showed that you can apply it to OCT on FOSS, optic nerve head images, and achieve high diagnostic accuracy for differentiating between eyes with and without glaucomatous visual field damage, and predicting the severity of visual field damage as measured by the mean deviation. And this is a study that was led by Mark Christopher, uh, newly joined our faculty. Are we going to use are we going to use artificial intelligence in our practice? Sally did this, this I, it, it, it's almost a trivial study, but I think it's a very important study. She worked with Jimmy Chen, who's one of our uh, PGY1 ophthalmology residents. And they, you know, they asked the question, are, are clinicians going to accept deep learning? Uh, because you can have all these metrics, but if you're not going to use it and you don't have a way of implementing it into your clinical practice, and the conclusion is that clinicians will accept a clinical decision support tool designed to present artificial intelligence model outputs in a useful, trustworthy manner. So I think, you know, going forward, that that's something that's going to change. But there's also some other things that are going to change, and I think have to change because I'm not sure we can rely only on the stuff that we have. Um, particularly since we have a lot of agents and, and it's not clear how many patients we're going to need in trials. And one approach might be biomarkers, uh, you know, the use of biomarkers to enable rapid, sensitive, objective assessment of the effectiveness of the clinical intubation and, and further shorten trials. So biomarkers are really not new. Uh, they can appear before disease onset. Uh, they're used for detecting and monitoring of retinal metabolic dysfunction at micro level precision. Um, and they're already being used in a number of neurodegenerative conditions, being used in Parkinson's, they're being used in traumatic brain injury and, and other neurodegenerative diseases. And, and, you know, why not a biomarker for glaucoma? Uh, it was a potential biomarker. Uh, how about amyloid? This is something that's been discussed for a long time. It sort of dies. Somebody picks, picks it up, they get a grant, and then it disappears. And then somebody else picks it up, and they get a grant, and it disappears again. There's, you know, you look at the literature, and there's a lot of really good evidence for amyloid uh, as having something to do with glaucoma damage. And I, I listed some of the things. I'm not going to go through it, but but you know, we can measure amyloid in the retina now. 
uh, and we've done that. Uh, perhaps something like that could be useful for glaucoma. But there are other small molecule, molecule ocular traces for non-invasive imaging of retinal amyloid. Uh, they bind to beta amyloid. And you can use simple cameras, uh, fundo, fundus autofluorescent cameras with barrier filters. And, and you have clinical trials ongoing now with uh, ALS, with Parkinson's disease, targeting two different uh, potential biomarkers with alpha synuclein and also TDP43. Uh, why not for glaucoma? And then why not, it's not one or the other, but why not use biomarkers and combine them with some of the other things that we're doing? Uh, and then using AI-based analytics to define glaucoma-related structural, vascular, and biomarker signatures from very high-content retinal imaging data. And I think that'll be a, a very robust way of doing you know, these things going forward. There are other potential tests for glaucoma biomarkers. These are some of the things that I've been thinking of and, and, and looking at, uh, including fundus fluorescence, hyperspectral imaging, and fluorescent lifetime imaging. And some of you might have ideas as well for other glaucoma biomarkers. So to summarize, and I'll keep my summary simple, uh, glaucoma neuroprotection clinical trials with reasonable numbers and cost are achievable. Novel analytics and new testing paradigms will reduce the number of patients, cost, and time of clinical trials. And a neuroprotective drug for glaucoma will preserve the vision of countless individuals throughout the world. So it's something that, that we all want. It's something that we all need. I think it's there. I hope in 25 years we won't be meeting here and wondering why we still don't have a neuroprotective agent. Uh, several of us got together in an advisory board, I don't know, it was 15 years ago, Jeff, and we were asked, uh, when are we gonna have a neuroprotective agent? And uh, every, a group of glaucoma experts, Jeff was one of them, uh, we, all, we all voted, and it might have even been more than 15 years ago. I remember thinking I'm gonna be very conservative. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say 10 years, 10 years. Well, that's already at least five or 10 years past what, what I predicted and, and I think what everyone else predicted. But I think the future is bright. I think there is a, a strong likelihood that we will have something, including the next slide. Oh, can we go back one? There we go. Um, I work with a number of people, but there, there's, there's nobody who I work closer with than the amazing fellows that we've trained, including 26 department chairs now, uh, and the collaborators at, uh, at UCSD, Shiley Eye Institute, Hamilton Glaucoma Center, uh, and then a number of individuals worldwide who we have ongoing projects with, uh, including in the room, Jeff Liebman and, and Felipe, who was just doing amazing work. Uh, this is our Viterbi Family Vision Research Center. We have a CAM set up, so we actually are watching it being built. There's a big hole in the ground, and you could go to the CAM, and you see the bulldozers moving dirt. It's a dedicated vision research building adjacent to our clinical facility. I want to acknowledge you know, the uh, direct funders of the work that I talked about today, uh, including the NIH and the National Eye Institute and the support I've gotten uh, from them directly. Oh, thank you. And then I'm so glad Felipe showed up because I, I sort of left the you know, the great stuff for you, Felipe, and, and of course it's well-deserved. Um, you know, there's been just this amazing outpouring over the last several months. I, I think it's an anticipation of this move to Miami that there's just this outpouring of publications and, and brilliant work that you're doing, and I'm looking forward to learning more from you as I always do. <laughs>
Thank you so much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to thank the invitation. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry that I was not here in the morning uh, and I missed uh, Lou Pasquale talk on AI. So hopefully there won't be much overlap here. Uh, I will uh, address mainly potential uses of AI for um, uh, clinical trials. These are my uh, financial disclosures, but there's nothing really uh, particularly um, directly related to this. So I wonder if uh, people in the audience know who these three guys are. Anyone? They, they look like uh, they might be from Chechnya. <laughs> and they're part of the, the group that's assisting uh, Putin. In Europe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good guess. So they're actually uh, uh, co-authors of what is turning out to be perhaps one of the most important papers in the history of science. So, which is called the attention is all you need. And what this paper does is that it actually introduced the transformers, which is the, the type of uh, neural network that is, has initiated the whole uh, large language model revolution uh, that uh, gave rise to the chat GPT and all the derivations. So the transformers, which are based on the so-called self-attention mechanism that I will uh, talk a little bit about later. And this paper has received, uh, I think by now, over 100,000 uh, citations. Uh, and it's interesting when we look at the time that it took to reach 100 million users for different technologies. And for the telephone, it was 75 years. For the cell phone was 16 years. For chat GPT was like two months for 100 million users. And essentially everyone is using this uh, 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 now as, as we speak. So it's quite an amazing tool. And it's interesting that there's even a research paper that has been published with chat GPT as a co-author. Uh, and that actually, uh, th that paper got a lot of heat because of that. And, uh, and then uh, the publishers had to get together and decide what to do about it. Is this gonna be allowed or not? Anyway, this is, there's a lot of uh, controversy right now around this, this very issue. More recently, uh, the OpenAI actually released the ChatGPT4 and the, the newest model actually can process images. This is not quite open to the public as we speak, but there are ways that you can uh, get access to like the sort of like the prototype tool. And it's interesting, you can actually enter an image and it will give you the interpretation. For example, you can enter that image and just ask, solve this. And it will actually read what is asking uh, and give you the answer. So as an AI, I am unable to interact with images or perform actions like clicking on them. However, I can guide you on which images contain crosswalks. So it actually read there that you need to select the crosswalks. And then the images are the first on the top row, the second on the middle row, and the first on the bottom row. So that's quite amazing because now we we can think about what's going to do when we input some x-ray or someone it's going to give you the interpretation and how this what word is going to get uh, at some point as so it's quite an amazing tool now with the ability to also process images so uh, as i mentioned the transformers are based on this self-attention mechanism that was described on that original paper, attention is all you need. And essentially is a type of neural network model that uh, sort of learns to weight the importance of uh, each uh, input piece relative to the others in a sequence. And that sequence can be a very long sequence. So it's like when you're having a conversation, you know if some topic is coming up very often, well, this is more important, but if some was something that was mentioned a long time ago and, and it hasn't been mentioned again, well, it, the, the weight keeps decreasing. So this allows the model to capture this uh, long-term range, long-range dependencies and the complex relationships 
And you can do that with images. And I'm going to show you uh, in the context of uh, 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 assessing glaucoma progression uh, later on. So how can AI help facilitate neuroprotection trials? Well, we can think of several ways uh, that AI could be helpful. For example, patient recruitment and selection, uh, data collection, analysis and visualization, uh, new endpoints, uh, as well as discover potentially new treatment targets from analysis of complex uh, data, genetic information, and so on. So let's mention uh, uh, some of these, give some examples of some work related to this. So in terms of patient selection and recruitment, and uh, Bob Weiner mentioned already the importance of this in the context of uh, neuroprotection clinical trials. So AI could then potentially be used as a tool to identify suitable candidates for the trials based on the analysis of complex information from the EHR, or for example, the use of predictive models to identify patients at high risk for progression. Uh, one of the critical things when we're thinking about uh, the design of a neuroprotection trial, and again, this was mentioned uh, uh, by Bob, is the uh, sample size requirements. And in this uh, uh, work here, what we did was to look at the relationship between the velocity of progression of patients and sample size requirements in a clinical trial if that trial were to use something like the rate of progression as an endpoint. And as you can see, there's this exponential relationship so that if the, the, the rate of change in the patients included in the study is actually slow, uh, you need huge sample sizes. Uh, and that goes up exponentially. So meaning that the trials that include very slow progressing patients are likely to need really huge sample sizes. So, so how can we then address this issue? So one idea is to then search for patients at higher risk, so they could then be included in this trial. So uh, a few years ago, Josh Stein uh, published this very nice example of how you could potentially identify patients with exfoliation from a more comprehensive analysis of EHR data. We all know how we sometimes uh, have to look at several different uh, uh, areas, the clinical exam or the notes and, and coding to actually be able to identify patients. And he showed how you can use natural language processing to look at the notes and to successfully identify such patients. Uh, and this other uh, work by uh, Sally Baxter, uh, Bob Weinreb, so they look at predicting the need for glaucoma surgical intervention from EHR data. So the idea here would be to look at some systemic factors, the data that was in the EHR to then predict surgery. So you can think of, of this also as a way of predicting uh, risk for progression or risk for uh, a severe disease. So similar models, then you, you could think of similar models being used to perhaps select patients ahead for a clinical trial. You can see that the performance, the areas under the ROC curves, they are not that high. They are around like 0 0.7 or so, but th that's a tough job uh, to actually predict the future based on a series of systemic and, and baseline risk factors. So uh, and I'm going to go over a little bit uh, more about this later on, but it's a tough job to do that, but perhaps would actually help us then select a certain pool of patients that would be candidates uh, um, for the trial. In, the, in this work here, uh, we looked at over uh, 40,000 patients and used the model to actually predict patients at risk for depression and, and anxiety uh, from uh, EHR data. And of course, these are patients that you may want to avoid in a trial, uh, but it depends on the purpose, of course. Uh, but the model did well in predicting those kinds of things. So again, variations of these models could then be used depending on the trial that you want to set up. 
Lou Pasquale uh, published this work here with uh, CMAC, Yusefi, uh, Chris Johnson on looking at the archetypes as a way of identifying fast progressors in the old study. So all these are examples of how AI could then be used for this patient selection that we we're talking about. So how about uh, improving the quality assessment of clinical trial data? I think this may actually be the low hanging fruit here uh, is the idea of using AI to assist or perhaps even replace subject human based uh, uh, reading centers that are responsible to look at the quality of the data and things like that. We can train AI models to do that job very well. Uh, we uh, published this work here where we trained uh, a deep learning model to detect segmentation errors on OCT, and it performs extremely well. It detects pretty much all of them. Uh, it, it performed as well as a highly qualified reading center. You can see the segmentation errors there being identified with the color code maps, and you see in red where the, the line goes to the vitreous there and it misses the nerve fiber layer. So these are things that are done nowadays. The, the, the companies have to pay for expensive reading centers in order to do that, but it's something that could potentially be automated with AI, I, I think. Uh, interestingly enough, the quality score is not enough. These are scans with perfect quality, but they have like big segmentation errors like you see there that the posterior border of the nerve fiber layer is missed by the algorithm. Uh, but the AI model goes there and finds it where there is a segmentation error. And even tiny ones, and when we we, we, there was some disagreement between the reading center and the AI. And when we went back to look at those disagreements, pretty much in all cases, it was because it was something small that was missed by the reading center, like this. So you can see there's a very tiny uh, segmentation error there. It's likely irrelevant in, for the measurements, uh, for overall measurements. But again, the, the, the AI model actually picked that up. So you can train these models for that or for other things that are nowadays done by reading centers to look at patterns of visual fields. You can think of training an AI model like Lou's work to identify those patterns and make sure that they are glaucomatous, for example. That's something that is done subjectively nowadays or looking at uh, learning effects or things like that. So this is really, I think it's a, it's a low hanging fruit because it's something that AI could be used right away. I think training these models to uh, at least assist the reading centers in doing that. Uh, an exciting area is of course, the development of new endpoints. And uh, I believe with AI, we can get to better endpoints uh, that will likely lead to more efficient trials by using complex structural and functional information, a combination of tests, like what uh, uh, Bob Weiner was showing in the uh, last few slides he had. And these endpoints may have better signal to noise ratio and less variability. And we can think about maybe also potential endpoints in combination with certain modalities of testing that could be used for home-based testing. So we talked about how uh, AI can detect segmentation errors, but uh, in this work here, we actually train the model to detect glaucoma based just on the raw scan. So you don't even need to segment uh, the nerve fiber layer actually to be able to detect glaucoma on these scans. Once you train the deep learning model, it then just uses the raw scan to actually detect the areas there, there, there is thinning like you see that in this case where there is a thinning in the inferior nerve fiber layer corresponding to the superior visual field defect. Progression is a bit more tricky, of course, and we know that one of the toughest things about progression is the lack of a perfect reference standard. And we need these reference standards in order to train the AI models. In this work here, what we did is we gave the sequence of scans to uh, expert graders and ask them to grade for progression over time. 
So because we gave them the sequence of scans, that makes it for more specific grading, a more reliable grading, because they can see if the area of suspicious progression confirms over time. Then once they did and graded each one of the uh, scans compared to the baseline, but again, taking into account the whole sequence, we then trained uh, the, the deep learning model to uh, identify uh, if there was progression of each scan during follow-up compared to the baseline. And it does great in doing that. And it outperforms all the summary parameters or trend-based analysis of uh, trend-based uh, neurofibrillar thickness or trend-based sectoral thickness for detecting progression. Uh, it can give you a... Um, uh, probability assessment for progression. So in this case, in an area. So in, in this uh, uh, here, you what you see is over time, as there's more change than the probability of progression given by the deep learning model increases. So it was 7% at the beginning, then 30%, 71. And as the change becomes very clear, then the probability actually went close to 100%. And in red, you see the areas where it found that to be happening. So, but you could claim, well, uh, but still this is using human graders to do that. So is there a way that we could maybe overcome that issue of having to rely on the human graders? Uh, and of course, this is an issue uh, for debate at this point. What is the best way to actually train those models? and develop this progression algorithms. We have tried some different approaches. One that we have just uh, worked that was just being completed is uh, we took several steps. First, we actually trained the model to sort of like recognize known progression. And the way we did this, that was scrambling the images. So you would just scramble and remove the sequence of the images and you would just randomly scramble them so that you remove any trends. Uh, and then you sort of like train the model on those scrambled images so that it can learn what a known progression is. Uh, and then you apply to the original sequences and see the ones that it identifies as changing. That does not work very well if it's done just that. Uh, we realize that actually it ends up detecting almost all the original sequences as progression. So interestingly, that happens because there are some age-related changes that happen on the scan. And those age-related changes are not really only on the nerve fiber layer, but also on some of the other layers. So it sort of learns that, that actually you have those changes. So then you do also need to train the model to learn what age-related changes are and then you give the sequence of healthy eyes. So one of the age-related changes they are very common is like the vitreous separation there. And then again, if you train the model that way and you don't tell that that is a, a, an age-related change, it will confound that as a, as, a, as a true change over time. So it's important to also train that. So once you take these steps, then actually gets pretty good. So at the same specificity, uh, and when compared to uh, a common method like linear regression of uh, parameters over time, for the same specificity, you get a much better hit ratio compared to linear regression. So uh, uh, we talked about transformers and we use the transformers to do that. And um, uh, also another work here uh, by the Wilmer group, uh, uh, Predict and uh, Johannan, they looked at using um, those uh, transformer networks with OCT data to predict visual field uh, changes. So we could also think about maybe developing some uh, uh, techniques that would be may have uh, perhaps applicability even in the when you don't have uh, uh, sophisticated machines. And some of you are familiar with this work that we did uh, called Machine to Machine, where we trained uh, deep learning models to 
predict nerve fiber layer thickness from photographs. These models were trained by having pairs of photos and OCTs and trained the model to uh, predict from a photo what the OCT result is. And what is interesting is that it does do a great job in actually detecting changes over time. So here you see an example where you see the slope in blue of OCT changes and the slope in red correspond to just the predictions of nerve fiber layer thickness from photographs, okay? And you can see how these slopes were actually quite similar. You can see this was a nerve that was showing change if you look carefully, you will see inferiorly that there is an area of thinning and a little uh, disc hemorrhage at the last uh, 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 photograph on your right there. And here's some other examples where it does well in detecting progression over time. So you can think about a model like this, uh, perhaps being incorporated to some portable device, and then it opens up the possibility that perhaps patients could be participating in a trial and have some kind of home-based assessment or device that could take regular photographs or their optic nerves where we would then get those measurements uh, very often over time to get more reliable uh, 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 metrics. So you can think about maybe portable cameras or we've been working on some goggles that incorporate those cameras as well and at the same time doing some electrophysiology assessments. So I just want to uh, 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 conclude here with some words about bias and limitations on study design and, and data sets, and that it's going to limit what AI can do. Uh, and of course, there are several bias that can result from not including uh, diverse populations well enough and things like that. But one of the... Uh, critical things that I want to address here in the context of glaucoma is the uh, potential bias that happened from using retrospective data sets uh, where patients have been treated according to let's uh, clinicians decision and how that can influence these predictive models so let me try to explain that so the idea is we have these models that we think they're fantastic and you want to use them to predict who is going to uh, 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 progress in glaucoma. However, the problem is, uh, as you know, patients arrive in clinic and if they have a high pressure, pressure of 30, they're gonna get some treatment and they're gonna get more treatment if the pressure is higher or if they have some other risk factors like a hemorrhage. They may end up getting a surgery if they have uh, lots of risk factors like that so they may have had a trabeculectomy, and because of that, they never really progressed. So if you use that data to try to develop a predictive model from baseline factors, it's not really gonna work very well because of course the risk factors never really translated into progression because there was an intervention there that avoided that from happening. So if you try to relate then the baseline factors to what happened to the patient, then it, the model is not really going to work very well to predict if applied to a new patient that comes to you. So in these observational studies, eyes at higher risk of baseline will often get more treatment that will decrease the chance of progression. So this is a very frequent bias that we see in a lot of uh, 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 models, these models and publications. And sometimes you even find weird things like higher pressure being associated with a lower risk of progression. And that's because, again, of this. So you need to be careful when you're developing these models. So in conclusion, there are many things that I've, I believe AI will be able to do and help us with clinical trials and patient selection, selecting the best candidates for the trials, quality assessment, automate and improve quality assessment, development of better endpoints that will make better use of the whole uh, a set of images and, and tests that we have. And also discover new relationships from analysis of complex data. So from genetic data that we're gonna get an improvement of, of models and discover new targets. I would like to thank my collaborators and people in the lab who've done the work here.
And thank you very much for the invitation again. So we have microphones, including a dedicated one for Dr. Kawaja. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I want to thank Elena for uh, recognizing. Um, I'm going to open it up to discussion, questions. Anthony, you have a microphone, and I know you're eager to ask something. Well, I first, I just want to, that was amazing. And but Bob, you kept on saying, you know, best whatever, best whatever. That, that, that you know, was one of the best sessions on neuroprotection I've ever attended. And, and thank you, Derek, for going through some of the basic science uh, so clearly. I'm not sure I've ever understood it as well. What, one thing that really struck me was the strength of effect of these things. It's like, I would have thought neuro, you know, neurodegeneration and protection would be quite complex. And so it really struck me that if you just upregulate this one part of this crazy thing, you get such robust protection. And if you just do it with this other molecule, you get such robust protection. Is that, did that surprise you as well? Or do you have a, an idea about why, why you're getting such mammoth effects? Is this on? Okay, so I think it has a lot to do with how these things are discovered, right? If you look at SARM, if you look at DLK, these are screened because you've looked through essentially all genes in the genome and selected those with the biggest phenotype. So then I guess we shouldn't be particularly surprised when you get this gigantic phenotype when you look at those genes. It's, it, I think it's the power of screening. You know, that was true for SARM with Mark Freeman's work or DLK and LZK. I, I think that's the explanation. Can, can I follow up on that question? And, and, and I'm sure you have more, but I, I think it's an important question. And, and it goes to you, Derek. Um, because it, you did show very powerful protection. But we need to be reminded that these are experimental studies um, in rodents. And, and in experimental studies, you know, particularly in rodents, there are things that might not translate over to clinical studies in, in humans. Um, one of those things, of course, is always you know, the dose. How do you select the right dose to use? We have we have four trials of niacin that are underway. And, you know, what's the right dose? Do we know that? And how do you select a dose from the clinical trials? That's part one. Part two is what's the right timing? Because, uh, you know, in DLK, you know, you're, you're giving your injection at the time of injury. Now, gosh, do we know the time of injury in glaucoma? Um, is it something that, that started at birth? Is it something that is ongoing or is, is it episodic? Maybe talk about, you know, how do we translate experimental results to clinical trials of neuroprotection and then into clinical practice uh, using examples, for example, of the dose and also maybe the time of delivery. So to the first part, this is the importance in my mind of having a well-defined biology that you are intervening on, something that is well understood so that you can look for target engagement. So I'll give you an example. With DLK, you can look in the retina for phosphorylation of those downstream transcription factors you know you're giving enough drug if you shut off that downstream phosphorylation. And then it's not a stretch to scale up to larger animal models like mini pigs or monkeys to see if your doses translate because you have that biomarker or target engagement. When you have a drug that you don't exactly know how it works, but you know it works, I think that becomes more challenging because then you don't really know how to dose it. But for things like nicotinamide, we know what we're trying to do. We're trying to preserve axonal NAD level. So there's a titratable uh, endpoint. In terms of the how often to give it or when to give it, I can think- I, Can I just go back yeah. a second? So is that sufficient then to scaling up to larger animals and, and assuming that those are going to translate into the human? Um, in the absence of a successful neuroprotective, I can't answer that yet. Mm -hmm. But I certainly think that there's a lot of confidence that if you can achieve something in a, if, 
if there was a large uh, non-human primate, you crank the pressure up to 40, 50, and you show protection with a given dose of a drug, and you know, be it based on geometry of the eye, how much bigger a human eye is, I think you'd be pretty confident that there, it has a chance of working in a human. We won't know. Does that represent chronic open angle glaucoma? Right. So that this is an issue, right? That all of our animal models, essentially all of them, are secondary glaucoma. We do something to raise the eye pressure rather acutely and rather markedly, and we see whether our neuroprotective intervention protects. And yet you have all these patients, and it's, you know, 40, 50 percent, that don't even have elevated eye pressure. And if there were animal models of sort of primary open angle glaucoma, that would be perfect. Oh, but, but there aren't. And, and, and that's the issue, right? We, so how do you address that? So I, I think, you know, if you think about who's going to get enrolled in a neuroprotection trial, I don't think it's un, it would be uncommon to have people with somewhat elevated eye pressures. They're not going to be the 30s and 40s because I don't think you want them to have surgery right then on enrollment in the trial. But I do think you're going to see people in the mildly elevated eye pressure. And actually, that can be modeled in rodents and non-human primates. And, and what about the timing of the intervention? Because it sounds, the model you described, you know, acute elevation of intraocular pressure, it sounds like a nice agent for patients who have acute elevations of intraocular pressure. But that's not primary open angle glaucoma. Right. And, so, and, and certainly one can talk, you know, is the first population for a neuroprotective trial, should it be open angle glaucoma? Should it be angle closure glaucoma? But actually, I think most of us have settled on open angle glaucoma is the better target population. But I think we, you know, for instance, we do optic nerve crush. We give a drug at the time of injury. And we see this great protection. But as you point out, that's not realistic. There, I think what we have to assume, and it is an assumption, is that glaucoma is, or open angle glaucoma, is a chronic injury. And so while any neuron on Tuesday, might, I might not be able to protect him, he's already been injured, gonna die, it's the ones in the future, I'm basically pre-treating them with a neuroprotective. And it's an assumption. So that, that deals with the timing of the dose. You accept that the, the timing might not be totally protective, but it, it might be preventative. Uh, of though for those neurons that have not yet been damaged exactly that is exactly how we think about it does that mean yeah does that tell us something about stage of the disease that should be entered into a clinical trial so i think there there's some realities right i think it would be great to have our first neuroprotective tested in a rather mild population where, I don't think that's realistic. Right? I think probably our, our first neuroprotectives are going to be tested in people with rather severe disease. So we're going to have to figure out a way to see that residual protection because those are the patients we're going to be treating for the, the first, you know, because this is going to be a first in class. So let me, let me segue over to Felipe because he can address that probably with AI, you know. Uh, but, but just a general question, Felipe. And it's, it's something I, I wonder about. I, I, I mean, the work is elegant, and it's, it's clearly important. Um, how do you get through regulatory barriers? How do you even, you know, okay, you, could, you can um, minimize or eliminate a reading center. Uh, what do you need to do to have the FDA buy into that? And how difficult is it going to be to implement that into a clinical trial? Yeah, that, that's that's a great point. Uh, everything we uh, that I've talked about, uh, yes, it uh, it looks nice, but there will be a lot of barriers that will need to be overcome for them to be implemented. You may develop a great endpoint that combines all those cool tests, OCT, visual fields, and OCTA, whatever, but then it's not going to be necessarily accepted. So they do have requirements for those endpoints, and you described uh, uh, some of the discussions with them. And I think their main point, and when 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 they're considering the setup of a trial, is always a matter of uh, risk and benefit and safety. They don't want to uh, 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 do anything that will bring harm to the patient. So then that's why they are strict to certain endpoints, because if it's not something that has a very nice, clear, proven 
uh, clinical translation, well, that uh, maybe will not benefit the patient. So, and I think that's what has made the OCT, all the OCT discussion with endpoints difficult is because of course, visual fields are a much more clear translation of how the patient uh, functions, right? So I think that is an ongoing discussion. I think there's, a, there's been a lot of advancement on that. But yes, every time you propose an endpoint, you have to go through a, a steps to validate them. And I think we sort of like did that recently with the, the paper you mentioned, the rates of mean deviation, which is, if you think about it, is such an, a simple and obvious thing, but that actually required the work to be done before actually they even considered that as a potential uh, endpoint. Because uh, as of right now, the endpoints are like contrast sensitivity, which is not feasible, uh, and visual acuity, or the uh, event base, like the glaucoma change probability. And so our idea is, well, let's do the rates of MD and show that it predicts the FDA clearly defined GCP or GPA endpoint first. So that it was a simple thing to do with a, a simple uh, endpoint like the rates of mean deviation. So with more complex things like combining OCT with AI, you're going to have to do that as well. I didn't want to go through that, but yes, it, that will be needed. It's not that you come up with that algorithm and oh yeah, that's ready for being incorporated. Not really. Yeah, that work will have to be done in showing that it predicts a clinically relevant endpoint. We, we have a unique advantage uh, and and we'll get to more questions, but I want to ask a question uh, first of our panel here. Um, Derek, uh, uh, you're moving it too quickly. Uh, guys, that was great. But I, I, I know I'm concluding right now. Uh, <laughs> Derek, how long before we have a neuroprotective agent for glaucoma? <laughs> Well, I've learned to now I've got to bet longer because of what you said, but I, I honestly think that we are on the time frame of, I mean, with nicotinamide currently being tried, you know, trialed now, I think we're in the, I'll go under five years. Felipe, how long? I think between five and 10. I wouldn't say under five. And, and we five. have one great advantage. Approved. <laughs> uh, since everybody's hungry, uh, you have to vote because the collective wisdom of the crowd is always better than any experts. Uh, I'm going to ask, Everybody here, uh, and this is, a, this is one of the polls that I love doing. Uh, are we gonna have a neuroprotective agent within zero to five years as Derek Wellsby predicts? Raise your hand. Are we gonna have one within five, is it gonna take five to 10 years, longer than zero to five? It's about the same, yes. And are we going to be back here with Elena <laughs> 10 to 15 years from now, wondering, are we going to have a neuroprotective agent? Yes. I would say that the five to 10 year sort of trumped the others, but I was surprised by the optimism of the group. And, you know, ignorance is bliss. And, and again, I think back, Jeff, to when we did this and we were very optimistic. I'm concerned, not about the science, Derek. I think the science is strong, it's compelling. Uh, I'm concerned about, you know, a mean deviation, you know, whether again, using the FDA current markers, you know, study that Felipe did, one that we had here in New York where they used an older uh, parameter to look at progression. I'm concerned if we can't even get simple things that we use in our clinical practice, that the hurdles are gonna, are gonna be great. So time will tell, but Elena, we're looking forward to an invitation <laughs> sometime, hopefully within the next five years, maybe within the next 10 years where we could continue the discussion and, and we'll do that over cookies and milk. Thanks again, everybody, great session.